Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. If you have your Bible, go ahead and grab that. Genesis chapter 17. We're also going to look at Acts chapter 15. So if you want to hold your place in Acts 15, we are going to start here in Genesis 17. And we're just going to walk through this verse by verse like we've been doing. Um, we're going to talk about something that... Uh, it may be a little bit awkward, but it's crucial to our understanding of, of not only uh, Abraham's life, but the covenant that God established with Abraham, because this practice is still in place to this day. And so uh, what we are going to do is we will pray, and then we will review what we talked about last time, and uh, then we'll dive in. So let's pray really quickly. God, we love you so much. We are so thankful uh, to gather uh, around your word pray that you continue to use this group to strengthen our knowledge of you and uh, to grow our faith as well. Use this time. It's in Christ's name. Amen. Now, if you will recall, God established his covenant with Abraham that he would make Abraham into a great nation, right? He's going to give Abraham descendants as numerous as the stars, uh, and, and his name will be great. He'll be a blessing to people. But 10 years had gone by since God made that covenant, and Abraham and his wife Sarah are getting advanced in age. It's going to become more and more difficult for them to have children. And so uh, Sarah and Abraham, that they jump the gun, and this is what we talked about in, in the last chapter. Uh, Sarah is, is in emotional turmoil in chapter 16. Uh, she fears that Abraham will leave her. If, if she is not able to have children or if, if they get too advanced in age and, and, and they're given no children. So uh, we have no indication that that was what Abraham was going to do, but it was common at the time. If a wife was barren, the husband would leave her. And so uh, she's fearing that. And so what she does seems odd, but it was customary for the time. She gives Abraham her Egyptian servant, Hagar, and asks Abraham to father a child through Hagar. Now, you ask what, what kind of wife would do that? Why would she suggest to do something like that? It was expected, right? That's what you did at the time. If, if you were unable to have children and your family was everything, you wanted to have a good long lineage, you would do anything to, to make sure that, that you had children. And surrogacy, uh, even, albeit a, an extreme form of surrogacy, uh, is something that was practiced in ancient times. And so, um, Abraham fathers a child with Hagar. His name is Ishmael. And uh, this is not Abraham and Sarah's finest moment. They treat Hagar harshly. Hagar runs away. But remember, God promises to give Hagar a large number of descendants and says that uh, Ishmael will have a, a, a large number of descendants as well. We'll talk more about that here in a little bit. We, we talked about the fact that um, those who practice uh, Islam. They trace their lineage to Ishmael. If you look at Genesis 16 and it says that God creates Ishmael into a great nation, he'll give him a large number of descendants. That doesn't mean that God is creating Muslims in this instance. Islam won't exist until 2,800 years after this moment. In that moment, God creates Arab people because we know that Ishmael and his descendants end up becoming the Arab people that dwell in the uh, farther Middle East so it's not talking about Muslims specifically. It's talking about uh, just the Arab people. We'll talk more about that here in a little bit because that blessing of Ishmael having children is going to be reestablished here in a little bit. But simply because Abraham and Sarah jumped the gun did not mean that God wasn't going to fulfill his promise. God always fulfills his promise, and the promise of Abraham having a natural child between the two of them is going to occur uh, and be foretold here in, in this particular chapter. So this is a big deal. Um, we'll get to talking more about the covenant. And uh, if you want really good detail on the covenant, you can go back and watch chapter 15 video, which is two weeks ago, where we really dug deep into the covenant. But we'll talk more about it here in chapter 17. So uh, uh, Ishmael has been born, uh, and more time has now passed, right? So they've waited 10 years and now they're waiting even longer for this child uh, child of promise uh, to come. So let's start reading here. Uh, Genesis chapter 17, starting in verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him. So Abraham's ages are, are significant here. Abram arrives in the land of Canaan when he is 76. He fathers Ishmael when he's 86. 
Now he's 99, so 13 more years have passed, and there's still no child. So th this is, this, Abraham and Sarah are, are playing this waiting game, right? And we talked about this last week. Waiting on the Lord sometimes isn't pleasant because we want what we want when we want it. And so um, they're now waiting another 13 years after uh, Ishmael was born. So just so you know, that means that now Ishmael is 13 years old. He's a teenager. We'll talk more about him here in a little bit. But they've been waiting so long, and now God is going to tell them when this child of promise is going to come. He's 99 years old at this point. Uh, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Now, in Hebrew, the name God Almighty is El Shaddai. So maybe you've heard, uh, I believe there was a, a worship song in the 90s titled El Shaddai. It means God Almighty. And that is the first time God refers to himself as that in all of scripture. So that's a significant portion. That's a significant phrase there. That's the first time God calls himself God Almighty. That's significant. He says, I am El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Continue to be faithful to me, Abraham. Continue to be faithful to me so that this covenant, right, is continually established. Remember, God says, if you move to this land, I will give you, right? You remain faithful to me. I will give you descendants as numerous as the stars. That's the covenant. We'll see there's another part of that covenant coming up. Verse three, then Abram fell on his face. That, that doesn't mean he passed out, right? That phrase, he fell on his face, is he's worshiping. He's prostrating himself. He's falling down in reverence before the God of the universe. That's what it means. You see that happen. Like in the book of Joshua, when God's servant comes to tell Joshua how to uh, uh, overcome the walls of Jericho, how they're going to get the walls to fall down, uh, Joshua falls on his face before before that servant. So it's an act of reverence. It's an act of worship, right? And you've got to think, if God were to show up in our presence, we would not stay seated in our chairs, would we? We would prostrate ourselves before him because it's, it's an act of worship. It's an act of reverence. So it sounds a little odd to say that he fell on his face. He didn't trip. He didn't pass out. He's worshiping. He, he's, he's in all that God is before him. And it's worth noting that the Lord has shown up to Abraham now four times. That's time number four. So that's really significant. God physically comes to uh, Abraham uh, four times. That's time number four. So this is really significant. And Abram falls on his face in reverence. And God said to him, verse three, and now verse four, behold, my covenant is with you. Remember, it's been established. My covenant's with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I've made you the father of a multitude of nations. That's really significant. When somebody establishes a covenant with God or has a genuine encounter with God, God often changes their name. Why? Because their identity is now found in him. Right? We're doing a series on Sunday morning on identity, and you see God change people's names all the time. It happens here. It happens with Sarah here in a couple of verses. It happens with Jacob. God changes his name to Israel. It happens with uh, Paul, right? First he's Saul, then he's Paul. You see name changes happen a lot, and it happens when a genuine encounter with God has taken place. And this is significant here. So the name Abram means exalted father. The name Abraham means father of nations, right? Father of multitudes. So remember, God promised he would give Abram, Abraham descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. He's going to be the father of a multitude of nations. So the name Abraham means father of many, father of nations, father of multitude, right? So he's now gone through a name change. From here on out, he's Abraham. Verse six, this is God still speaking. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you. He's saying, not only are you going to have lots of children, you are going to have kings in your family line. You're going to have exceedingly great people. When he talks about fruitful, he's talking about you will bear much fruit is what he's talking about, right? Bear much, there will be fruit from your seed, right, is what he's talking about. Uh, verse 7. 
Uh, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring forever. That is an incredibly significant verse because this covenant is not going to stop when Abraham dies. God has not only established this covenant with him, but he's established it with Abraham's descendants. And in that verse, what we see is something absolutely beautiful. This is an everlasting covenant. And God says, not only am I your God, Abraham, I'm going to be the God of your people forever. Right? This, is, this is beautiful, what, what's happening here. This is incredible. Verse eight, and I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So this covenant is not just for Abraham and Abraham's family. This covenant is also for the land of Canaan. Not only is this covenant an everlasting covenant, but the land that God has given them will be an everlasting possession of theirs. So this is key. This, this, this Abrahamic covenant serves as the foundation for all the other covenants that are going to happen, right? Specifically in the Old Testament. This is not the first covenant we've seen. Remember, there's the Noahic covenant, which is the covenant with Noah. But that's a little bit of an interesting one because remember, a covenant requires a promise from God and a commitment from humans. The Noahic covenant doesn't really require a commitment from humans. God says, I promise I will not flood the earth again. That was just his promise, and it's an everlasting promise, but it didn't require humans really to do anything. In this particular instance, God is saying, I will be the God of your ancestors, Abraham. I will give them this land forever because you have been faithful, right? So uh, this covenant here serves as the foundation for the other covenants that we will see. I will be their God. Isn't that incredible, right? Right? The grace that's involved there. Remember, sin is in the world at this point. This is a fallen world in which we find ourselves. Uh, and God, through his mercy, through his grace, says, I will be the God of your people. This is beautiful. They, they really, If you really let that sink in, this is an incredibly beautiful moment. But we continue on. Verse 9. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. We're going to get into right now the sign of the covenant. See, a covenant is not just verbal, right? There's usually a sign of the covenant. Remember that uh, in the Noahic covenant, there's the rainbow. Every time you look at a rainbow, you remember God's promise. Uh, in this particular instance, there's going to be another sign. How do God's people show that they are part of this covenant. Well, we're gonna get into this. I'm just gonna tell you, this may get a tad graphic. This may get a little bit awkward, but it's something we absolutely have to talk about. Remember, in Bible study, we talk about everything, no matter how awkward it could be, but I'm just forewarning you. Uh, verse 10, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. How do we show that, uh, how do males specifically show that they are a member of the covenant of God? They are circumcised. Prior to this, they weren't circumcised, right? This is where we get the covenant of circumcision. Um, so circumcision literally means cutting around. Technically speaking, circumcision is when the foreskin is removed from male genitalia. That's what circumcision is. And males are circumcised as a sign that they are part of the covenant of God, right? Circumcision at this point is a fairly minor operation, and we'll, we'll get the evidence of that here in a little bit. But that's how they're going to show, right? You, are, you show that you are a member, a partaker of this covenant by circumcising every male, in your household, whether that be a family member, whether that be a slave in your household, you circumcise everyone. Abraham himself will be. That's begun here. Verse 11, you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. So every male child when they were eight days old would be circumcised to show that they were a member of the covenant. 
Uh, why eight days old? Because at eight days old, their immune system is able to handle an operation like that. And that just further goes to show you how minor this operation really was. If an eight day old is able to handle it safely, uh, is able to bear it safely, then um, then you know that, that it's, a, it's a minor operation, albeit frankly, a painful one. Um, and by, by the way, uh, at this point, circumcision is done by the fathers. Later on, it's going to be done by a specialist, somebody you would have in the room with you when your wife was giving birth, and they would perform it. So it's not always performed by the fathers, but it is being performed by the fathers at this point. We're going to talk more about circumcision here in a second. Uh, also, at eight days old, not only is the child circumcised, but he's given his name. Right? I say he because this only applies to males, uh, circumcision. Um, women were part of the covenant too, right? But this is referring to men. Um, so not only did you were you circumcised at eight days, you were given your name at eight days, right? We know that from Luke chapter one. Let's see here. Verse 12. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who's not of your offering, uh, not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So, so shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. So I guess a big question here is why that? Why circumcision among all the other things that, that, that you could have picked? First of all, circumcision is uh, permanent, right? It, 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 this is an everlasting covenant, and you're going to be part of the covenant for, the whole, for your entire life. Then the sign needs to be something that's permanent, and, and, um, and, and circumcision certainly is that. So that, that is, that's the best guess I can give you is, is they choose circumcision because it is, is permanent, right? It, it's something permanent. Circumcision does not originate here, right? It was practiced by the Egyptians. It was practiced by other Canaanite uh, people groups. The difference is, is that the Egyptians and the other Canaanite groups would circumcise a male when they came to adolescence, and it was done as a rite of passage. By contrast, it's done in infancy among the Israelites um, to show that they are a part, born into God's covenant, right? That they're a member of the covenant, and it's done then. Uh, circumcision, like I said, it'll eventually be done by a, a specialist, right? Uh, that, that specialist is called a moil, right? A moil is one who, who performs a circumcision, uh, later on. Right now it's done by the fathers. Here's the thing though. God's people, right? The Israelites, um, become, get very, very exclusive when it comes to being a part of the nation of God, being a part of the covenant of God. They get extremely exclusive, so much so that circumcision actually becomes a, a source of pride for them. On one hand, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but they took it to a, a level it should not have been taken to. They looked upon Gentiles, Gentiles, anyone that's not a Jew, they looked upon Gentiles kind of with disgust because they weren't circumcised, right? And they would use the term uncircumcised or those of the uncircumcision uh, to refer to those who did not have the privilege of being part in the family of God. So they become very, very exclusive about it. Matter of fact, they become so exclusive that they be not only begin looking their nose down upon those who are not circumcised and part of the family of God, the issue of circumcision becomes a problem in the early church Right there was a bit kind of the one of the first issues that the church really deals with, theologically speaking, was the issue of should these new Gentile Christians uh, be circumcised? Do they need to be circumcised too? Um, so let's look at Acts chapter fifteen. Turn with me there. Acts chapter fifteen. We're just going to read certain parts of this. So this is something called the Jerusalem Council. If you remember uh, a couple of years ago, we walked through the entire book of Acts. Um, and this, this, this is a big issue, right, in the, in the local church or the early church. Should Gentiles have to be circumcised too? So let's read here. 
Uh, I'm really just going to read through this, make some comments. We don't have enough time to go through this line by every line, but I'll pull out some things. So let's start reading here. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Well, that's a big issue. They were teach some people of the early church were teaching, not only must you believe on the Lord Jesus, be baptized, but you also have to be circumcised. If you're not circumcised, you're not really saved. That's a very bold thing, and that creates a really big problem, right? Um, so let's keep reading. And after Paul and Barnabas had uh, had no small discussion and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas, they go to Jerusalem and when they're there, they give a report on all these Gentiles that have come to know Jesus. And that brings great joy to everybody in the church. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, and they declared that uh, all that God had done with them. But some, of, but some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, is it, um, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Now, even though we are after the resurrection of Jesus, even though now um, the people are being called Christians, People are still being very legalistic and holding to the law of Moses, not keeping in mind that Christ had fulfilled the law. And we are, um, we keep the law now by being faithful to Jesus, right? They are still being very legalistic. You must keep the law of Moses in conjunction with this relationship with Christ. And so therefore they thought that they needed to keep the covenant of circumcision too. Verse 6, the apostles and elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up. Remember, disciple Peter. Peter stood up um, and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He's saying, the Gentiles have received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit just as the Jews have. He made no distinction between us and them having cleansed their hearts by faith. They've received the exact same amount of grace, right? Jesus came not just for the Jewish people. He came for all people. They've received the same amount of grace. God has not made distinction, right? They're all the same. They've received the same Holy Spirit. They've received the same amount of grace, right? Uh, that's what he's talking about here. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. Salvation comes in Christ. It has nothing to do with circumcision or not. That's what he's getting at. If you look up, we'll skip a little bit, look up to verse 19. Therefore, my judgment, this is what James says. Uh, James is the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them. He said, listen, we don't need to trouble the Gentiles with this issue, right, of circumcision. We need to write to them to encourage them. Listen, if you're going to follow Jesus, you must believe on him, right? You're going to be baptized. You're going to abstain from things like sexual immorality and sin, right? But whether you're circumcised or not, that should not be the issue here, right? And, and so what the church ended up deciding was is that Christ's grace is enough, right? His grace is sufficient. So they don't need to be circumcised, right, in order to be a part of the family of God now because of what Christ has done. So we see the roots of circumcision, at least in the nation of Israel, happening back here in Genesis 17. By the way, turn with me back to 17 now. We see them... Um, we see the roots of circumcision here, but the because of our, our, our human flesh, what will happen is that the Jewish people will become very rigid and exclusive about circumcision, and you see it ends up becoming a problem, right? Uh, at, at least in terms of pride. Um, 
But now we're back here in, in Genesis chapter 17. Let's look at verse 14. This is God still speaking. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. That's kind of a pun. Remember, when someone is circumcised, flesh is cut off. If someone is not circumcised, they are cut off from the people, right? So it's, it's kind of a play on words. He has broken my covenant, right? You've broken the covenant if you're not circumcised. Right, that's what he's saying. So now that that's been talked about, let's start here in verse 15. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Both names mean princess. So she also goes through a name change. Now they are officially known as Abraham and Sarah instead of Abram and Sarai, right? Verse 16. I will bless her and moreover, I will give you a son by her. This covenant... Is, does not just mean Abraham will be blessed. Sarah is also a member of that covenant and she is equally blessed. And you'll notice it says, I will give you a son by her. This son, is, the son of promise from God is going to be um, a natural son, right? Not a son by a surrogate, not by someone else. This is a natural son. I will bless her and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her, right? You are going to have Abraham, you are going to have kings as your descendants. Sarah's going to have the same. She's going to give birth to those who will eventually give birth to kings. Verse 17, then Abraham fell on his face. Once again, that's an act of worship. Fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who's 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who's 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham, oh, so Abraham's laughing. This is not because he's faithless, Right? I can't really blame him, right, for, for laughing in this instance. He has waited so long for a child that now when he'll be 100, right, Sarah will be 90, um, they are finally going to have a child, and Abraham finally laughs. So this is not out of spite. This is not uh, Abraham being a smart aleck. This is him. He, he's finally laughing. You know, he, he is uh, He's almost giddy at the fact of, of what God is going to do even in their advanced age, right? He's very excited. Uh, verse 18, Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. This shows Abraham's love for his other son, which is Ishmael. Sometimes I think we get it in our head that, that uh, Abraham has this disdain for Ishmael and that he hates him. Of course he doesn't. He's, uh, he loves his son, right? As he should. I mean, he's his son. Um, and he says, God, please don't get rid of Ishmael, is what he means. Oh, that Ishmael may live before you. And, and God says, no, meaning, no, I'm not going to harm Ishmael, right? No harm is going to befall Ishmael. Um, verse 19, God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. Isaac means laughter. Abraham laughs when he hears that he's going to have a, a child in his advanced age. And in the next chapter, chapter 18, we will see that Sarah laughs as well. So Isaac's name means laughter. Um, I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. God's just reiterating what he already said. Remember, your covenant, this covenant is not just for you, Abraham. This covenant is also established with your offspring that's going to come after you. Let's see here. Verse 20. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you this time next year. Remember, Ishmael is going to get blessed. He's going to give birth to 12 sons and he's going to have lots of children, right? God makes Ishmael into a nation as well. The covenant, however, is established through Isaac and Isaac's offspring. Why? Because Isaac is the child of promise. Ishmael isn't. Remember, God said, Abraham, you need to wait on this child. He doesn't. He has Ishmael. But God still fulfills the promise and gives him Isaac, and that is who the covenant is established through, right? So Ishmael is made into a great nation. Remember, they become the Arab people, right? Not Muslims. They become the Arab people. Um, but the covenant that God is talking about here, lots of generations, I will be their God, is established with, um, uh, with the 
offspring of Isaac. So one of the things that Muslim people will tell you is that we worship the same God. That's not true. Muslims and Christians do not worship the same God. If you look at them, if you look at the Muslim concept for God, not even close to the, the one true God of the universe. And the answer for how we don't worship the same God is right here. Remember, the covenant says, I will be the God of your people. And the people I will be the God of are the offspring of Isaac, not the offspring of Ishmael, right? It's crucial that we understand that. Verse 22, when he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Now that's interesting because most often we hear about God coming down to talk to people. And in this instance, we see God going back up. It's a pretty cool detail. Then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day as God had said to him. God establishes uh, circumcision as a sign of the covenant, and Abraham does it that very day, not only in himself but in those of his household. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised. And all the men of his house, those born in the house and those bought with the money as a foreigner, were circumcised with him. So uh, what we see here is the covenant, the sign of the covenant firmly established. And now it has been... Um, now it's been put into place. In this instance, um, God has said, if you're going to be a member of my covenant, you are going to circumcise every male on the day, on the eighth day of their life. Now, obviously, that is moving forward. Abraham's 99 when he's circumcised. Ishmael is 13 when he is circumcised. Um, but from that point forward, it's going to happen to males who are eight days old or or who are eight days old, right? That's when it will happen. So next week, we'll get into chapter 18. We'll talk about um, more about Abraham and uh, the birth of Isaac, right? We'll get into that a little bit. And uh, from there, uh, we'll, we'll move forward with Abraham's descendants and this child of promise being born. So uh, if you have questions, my email is in the description of this video. If you have any prayer requests, uh, make sure that you send those to me as well. Uh, I will ask one prayer request for me. I am speaking in KCU's chapel service tomorrow morning, so just prayers for that would be much appreciated. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. God, we love you. We are so thankful to gather here, so thankful that you always keep your promises. I pray that you continue to use this group to strengthen our knowledge and faith in you. God, I pray for any prayer requests that are on our hearts that you will uh, bring comfort and healing and strength to all situations. Um, we love you. It's in Christ's name. Amen. One more thing. We are back to two services this week at 9 and 1030. Hope to see you then. Have a great week.